Today's scripture is 1 Timothy 1, 5 through 6, and 18 through 19. The goal of his, this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith. Some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. Timothy, my son, I am giving you this command in keeping the prophecies once made about you, so that by recalling them you may fight the battle well, holding on to faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and, some, and so have suffered shipwreck with regard to the faith. bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you that we can come here and freely worship you, Lord, without persecution. Open up our eyes and ears to hear your words, to see the glories that you have created for us. Creation screams out. The rocks and, uh, would scream out if we didn't, Lord. The mountains bow down in reverence. All the stars and everything that we cannot even comprehend how great your glory is. Billions and billions of galaxies. Follow your commands, Lord. Lord, we need your filling of your spirit to follow your commands because we are a stiff-necked people. Open up our eyes and hearts to see Jesus so that we may live like him in this world through the power of your spirit. As we read this letter to Timothy, Paul's instructions, Lord, help us to commit firmly to following you, to know the task that is before us, to know that we are the hands and feet of Jesus Christ in this world. We pray this in his name. Amen. So saying that, praying that, sincere faith and a good conscience. What is sincere faith? What does that mean to you? And do you have a clear conscience that you're living out what you profess? That when this life is over and you meet Jesus face to face, that hopefully you hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. This love that God has for you, no greater love a man has than to lay down his life for his friend is God laid his only son down for you. Knowing all this from the beginning of time, we don't have to understand all that theology again, but the more you get a glimpse of that theology, how could God love me that much? So that when we're facing trials and tribulations and things in this world, we don't doubt because Satan will come in there and try to destroy us and, and keep us away from the faith. We won't doubt God's love because I can't fathom that kind of love. It's so great. Sincere faith. Faith that the Holy Spirit will grow and continue in you to maturity, to be like Christ. So that you can have a good conscience. Romans took us from sin to salvation to sanctification to sovereignty to service. Now that you've learned these different things and you know the great salvation that you have, who you were as enemies of God when Christ died for you and how the Spirit will change you, you can be transformed so that you can present yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is only reasonable service. Anything else is illogical, not reasonable whatsoever to continue to live your life for your own. Service. <clears throat> so I want you to think about who God is to you. The salvation that you have, the sins that you've been cleansed from to live a life anew. That Jesus Christ died for you to, so he could save you. Not to spend an eternity in heaven, that's, that's, that's a bonus. But to live a life as God created you in the flesh, while you have the flesh. God sanctified you, made you holy, and set you apart in this world by the power of the Holy Spirit so that you would be his obedient children and show people the light by the way you love God and the way you love our others, how you serve them. God is sovereign. He knows all things. He's in control of all things. And it doesn't hurt to question Him. But who are we to question Him? His ways are higher than us. We get to that when we do question Him. When we're down in a low, we get to the point where we have Him pick you, pick you up. When our faith is doubting, He restores our faith. He works 
a mighty miracle through you. As Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10 says, we are God's workmanship in Christ Jesus. Or I think the New Living Translation says we're His masterpiece. Because of our faith in Christ Jesus, we're saved and we're transformed literally from like what a caterpillar is to a butterfly, but much more magnificently than that. Because the word metamorpho means the transfiguration of Jesus. Where I don't know what they saw, but what they saw made the clothes that Jesus was wearing. I, I have a feeling he was wearing something darker. And also they shine so white that they couldn't even behold the glory. And that's just a sample. And we too are being transformed, Corinthians says. Are you doing that? Well, therefore, it's only reasonable, the thing to do is to give him my life. To quit struggling with it. He's in control of all things anyway. I'm not in control of anything. I don't know if I'll be here tomorrow or not. Or have the words to say or anything else. None of us do. So today is the day of our salvation. Today is the day to live as Jesus. Today is the day to tell others of the hope that we have. That's the only reasonable thing. And God is faithful. He will transform you into the image of Jesus Christ, who was the faithful servant who laid down his life for all. That's service. I was a slave to sin, but now I'm a slave to God. But I'm free to be that slave as long as I'm willing to deny myself, take up my cross, and follow after Jesus. I want to be a living hope in this world. And Paul writes to Timothy so that he shares that hope. But this week you should have read Romans 16 first before you read 1 Timothy chapters 1 to 4. Next week you read 1 Timothy chapter 5 and 6, and then you start in Luke. I will probably finish up with Timothy, probably won't go over Luke at this point. We'll go through the Gospel of Luke. We're not going through 2 Timothy now. Don't be confused and go there. Because 2 Timothy was written later for some different reasons. So they fall in our Bible, but not necessarily in what I'm preaching at. The end of Romans chapter 16, it says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in Chinchoria. I ask you receive her in the Lord in, the Lord in a way worthy of his people and to give her any help she may need from you. For she has been the benefactor of many people, including me. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me, not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. The work that is done by people living like Jesus in this world, doing good deeds and sharing the gospel message, growing the church, Jesus' church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against them. If you don't know it, the church in this world country is declining rapidly. It was declining. COVID came in. It's declining rapidly now. Oh, there are still many that profess Lord, Lord. But like we saw at, at the journey, <laughs> no one wants to commit right now. They've got out of the habit of meeting together. Now, when I say no one, I'm labeling all people. Don't get me wrong. And I'm so thankful that this church serves so well because I praise God and praise God that whenever I mention service here, somebody immediately steps up and says, I will serve. Here am I, Lord. Send me. Wow. That's encouraging to me. Comforting to me. I know that the Spirit of the Lord is in this place. Because I don't see it in some other churches that I get the chance to go see. I don't see it. I don't see it in pastors, and it brings me down. You guys help me lift me up simply by the way we serve together. That we care about the love of Christ Jesus. It's in our hearts, and we care about teaching it to our children. I pray for your children. I pray for my children. There's, I'm glad we've got some smaller children in here, but we really need to train them up. We need to talk about them, as it says in the Old Testament, to write the laws on their heart. Talk about them when we get up, when we go to bed, when we're going along, when we're eating. It, it just permeates you that if you get in the car with me, you know we're going to have a conversation to Jesus. What about Jesus? If we go to Sandpoint, you're going to have a lot of conversations. But if we simply go up to three miles, you're going to have a conversation. Because it's what permeates me. is my salvation that I have through Jesus Christ, the love that I have for Him. And giving any opportunity, I'm going to share that. And we are here to comfort. Steve's not in here now. You can tell him I said this. 
But one of the things that Bob said, you might, some of you are, who, are Bob? who is Bob? Bob is Mary Ann's husband that you don't see come to church. But he knows because Mary Ann is a light to him and he knows what some of the others. He told me, he said, Steve Fields just always tries to get me to go to church. And then he said after that, maybe one day I will. Wow. And he just sees Jesus. He sees Jesus. I remember John, before he passed away, John Savage that worked with me and stuff. When he died, he had the hope of Jesus Christ in his heart. And if you knew John that, he never was at peace at anything. But when he died, he was at peace. And that's because of the light that this church was. Not just me, the light that this church was. Be a light to others so that they can see Jesus in you. Now, I'm going to get off track a minute just because I want you to not go off track. <laughs> when you're reading God's Word and you're reading these letters specifically, look at the, the, who's writing the letter and why. Because so many times we quarrel over words. If you read any scripture lately, that's been in there a couple times. Not to quarrel over words. So we'll quarrel over words about... Well, what about these women being deacons? Because that's a big barrier in a lot of churches. So I mentioned that because <laughs> ironically, not ironically, <laughs> it's the pattern that we were reading these words. I didn't just put Timothy after it for this reason, but it falls this way. In Romans, Paul writes about a deacon who is a woman. But as you're reading in 1 Timothy, you're going to read about where he says, we have women be silent in the church. Don't take that theology out of context. And if you want to learn more with me, we'll go talk about that other than that. Correct. The word used for deacon is general neutral. It can be a man or a woman. It means a minister or servant. If you haven't figured that out yet, if you have faith in Jesus Christ, you are called to be a minister and to serve. In fact... You're a priest, Peter says, offering sacrifices to God that are pleasing. And Paul writes in Romans that you're to offer your body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, because there's the problem, but instead be transformed. Because when we get out of the habit of meeting together, we get conformed to this world again. And we think we have the best intentions Yes, I will serve Jesus when? If you can't serve Jesus today, when probably won't come. Be honest. And especially since you don't know if you're going to be here tomorrow or not. And there's proof of that today in this service. We have no idea when that time is over. So we need to love God, love others, and tell them the hope that we have. <clears throat> you're going to see the same word deacon in Timothy and we'll get to that in a minute but I want to finish out Romans Romans concluded this way a lot of greetings and everything in it but in Romans 16 verse 16 it does say greet another with a holy kiss don't go out crazy on that you can kiss me if you want to but probably won't kiss you back but we're supposed to have this fellowship this koinonia with each other so that we are different that people see the love of God in His people. All the churches of Christ send greetings. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teachings that you have learned. Keep away from them, for such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talking and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I rejoice because of you, but I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. You can take that to the bank. Jesus has already defeated Satan when he laid down his life on the cross, and there will be a day when Jesus returns and he reigns, and he binds Satan, and then Satan will be foreverly cast into the lake of fire. That's fact. We just haven't seen it come to uh, completion yet. 
And then Timothy is introduced right here. Verse 21, Timothy, my co-worker, sends his greetings to you. Drop down to verse 25 and to the end of the chapter. Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, established, firmly grounded where nothing can shake you, you didn't do it, God did it. It's not by works of righteousness where you're saved, and it's not by works that you can continue to do things. It's not by your own power. It's by dying to let Jesus live through you. So if you keep trying, just like you couldn't save yourself, you're not going to do good things. There's always going to be a reason that you don't. And the biggest reason is going to be that you're still holding on to the world instead of letting go of it. <clears throat> now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ, in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed to you and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all Gentiles might come to obedience that comes from faith. How many letters have we written, read that talk about the obedience we should have as God's people, and the only way that it comes is faith. Increase my faith, Lord. You should constantly be praying that. Verse 27, to the only wise God be glory forever through Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, when I did Romans, I told you not to concentrate on these different theologies, but could concentrate on the whole of the letter. Sin came. God is who God is. Sin came. He gave us a remedy. And wow, what a great salvation. And we can't do it on our own. And what a wretched person I am. But God does it for me through through the Spirit so that I can lay down my life and sacrifice. And I don't need to figure out all these things, but when the last person say that's supposed to be saved and whoever it is, God's in complete control, I will come into His presence forever and ever. Amen. That's the quickest summary I can give you of Romans. So that we go into 1 Timothy. A call for Timothy to live a life not because Paul thinks he's going to die at this point. That's what 2 Timothy is. But he just can't be in Ephesus and his church in Ephesus is having some problems. Timothy was a young man who believed by faith, and it mentions his mother and grandmother, two women in his life that made a difference. He was a man that lived by faith, and, and Paul was writing these letters to encourage him and so that he can address issues in this church. He's following in the footsteps of Paul, who follows in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. But he needs iron sharpening iron, and he needs to be aware of the problems that are in the church. First, let's address the problem. So I'm going to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. <clears throat> As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people, not everyone in the church, not to teach false doctrines, whatever those might be. Verse 4, or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Okay, so we can... Get some idea here. They were worried about genealogies and whatever the myths are and preaching that rather than the gospel message. Love God, love others, serve. <clears throat> Such things promote controversial speculation rather than what? Advancing God's Word, which is by faith. The more you read God's Word, the more you're in fellowship with one another, the more you pray, the more you're dependent upon the Holy Spirit, the more your faith will grow so that you can do what? Advance God's work rather than hindering it by being caught up in the world or being caught up in doctrines that keep us from serving as the hands and feet of Jesus Christ in this world. Stop for a second and look at the church. The church is either focused in politics and the world instead of the gospel message or they're divided with doctrines well, they are serving as Jesus served. Which church are we going to be? There's only one that's a church, real true church of Jesus. And that's the one that increases their faith and follows after Him in service. So I want to go back to Hebrews for a second. It's not been that long since we've read that and define what faith is. Hebrews chapter 11. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. Sherry and I talked about that a good bit on the way back. She kept saying, well, what about salvation here and everything? And it was always this other variable that came in. I said, so let's take a hypothetical. I said, let's go back to the Old West days. Not an Indian who's doing, you know, worshiping spirits or whatever. Let's take some children 
whose parents were God-fearing, but they died and orphaned them, and then somebody else raised them that never spoke of God, a white man, not, not a Native American or anything else, never talked to them about God whatsoever and how they'd be saved. Now, we're not going to go all down that boat. But I said, they never knew the name of Jesus. No minister ever came to them, anything else. I said, God is just. He's in control. So I said, we're not going all down these doctrines. And if one of those, and I think I said a boy and a girl and stuff, you know, those two children, whoever should be in heaven, will be in heaven. Don't chase the theologies and everything. God is sovereign. But it is our duty, since we know the name is Jesus Christ, and I can give you many stories of missionaries that went to some tribe or wherever they said, now we know his name. His name is Jesus. It's our job to proclaim. And the fact that we know, and if we don't, woe, 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 for whatever the reason is that you don't. Because you have those mysteries that we just said about that have now been revealed to you to serve. Now, faith is the confidence of what we hope for, for the assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. They didn't know the name of Jesus. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks the hope that we have, even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. You don't have to figure it all out, but if you know the name of Jesus, you better proclaim him. Verse 6, And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to Him, however that is, must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Faith put into action. Faith put into action. Faith put into action. James said, faith without works is dead. And then verse 7. My motto verse, I said it yesterday in a devotion that I gave down there at the meeting. By faith. How? By faith. Who? Noah. When warned about the things not yet seen, there is a coming judgment. We've all been warned about it. In holy fear, not fearing man, but fearing God, not because of the judgment that would come upon him, but because of who God is, he built an ark to save his family. How long did that take? <laughs> Most Christians cannot answer that question because there's not an answer, but they start digging for it because we want to find out how these things work. How does gravity work? What if it didn't? It works because God set that law. Could you imagine if it didn't? Wow, God did that to show you who He is and to give you these things that we have to give Him glory and thanks. When warned about things not yet seen, and Holyfield built an ark however long it took, whoever helped Him, and why did He do it? To save His family. If anything motivates you, to live a life for Christ. It's the ones that came after you, the children who are the blessings and the heritage from the Lord. Would you not do anything for them? You work to provide for them. So why would you not write the laws of God on their heart so that they know who He is? By faith, what did Noah do? He condemned the world, however long it took, whatever that meant. We don't know that while he was building, he wasn't having people throwing watermelons at him. We don't know. And he became an heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith, an heir because of who he was. He belonged to God. He was a child of God. And this was all through faith. So we're back to 1 Timothy. We're back to Romans ended, this faith that we have. So we drop down a couple more verses in Timothy. 1 Timothy 5 uh, 1 Timothy 1, verses 5 and 6. The goal of this command, the King James Version says the end, the finality of this command or commandment is to love. Agape love. Which comes from what? A pure heart, oh there it is, and a good conscience and sincere faith. Because your heart is made right. God's laws are written upon your heart because you've changed the way you think so that you live 
as a servant of Jesus Christ, and you have a clear conscience so that you know without a doubt that when Jesus Christ comes, you'll meet him face to face, and you won't hear, I don't know you. You'll hear, come home, child of mine, brother of mine. But some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. I put the but in there for emphasis. That's not what everybody does in the family called faith. Some of those people have departed from these things, so they don't have a clear conscience. They have a seared conscience. conscience. They don't have a pure heart. They don't have genuine faith. And instead, they turn to meaningless talk in the church. Paul writes of God's mercy on him, that he's the worst of all sinners. And he says, let that be an encouragement to anyone. If I was the worst of all sinners and see what I'm doing now, who can you be? You couldn't have been any worse than I am. Who could you be in Jesus Christ if you allow him to work through you? We get on down to 1 Timothy 1, verses 18 and 19, and he says, Timothy, my son, I am giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by recalling them, you may fight the battle well. Verse 19, what? Holding on to faith and a good conscience. Which, I'm going to put the but in there again, some have rejected. We just read about that. And what happens to them? They have suffered shipwreck with regard to their faith. If our life is a life of faith, as Hebrews says, and we're running the race, if the author of Hebrews starts out early in the letter that he's worried that you'll go adrift. He uses that term like we're going from, from this shore to that shore to reach that other heavenly shore. Adrift is bad. Shipwreck is really bad. You don't make it. You can come out of a drift possibly. But shipwreck is done. Hebrews 2, 1 says, We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. Drift away and what? Crash and be shipwrecked forever. Hold on to the faith you have. Have a clear conscience that comes from a pure heart that has changed the way you think to serve the Lord with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, all of your strength, because if you love Him, you will serve Him. 1 Timothy <coughs> chapter 3 Verse 9 says, talks more about that conscience. It says, I urge you then, and that's the paraclea word used, just like used in Romans 12, 1. I urge you, root word, it's the same thing as the Holy Spirit, to provide comfort and everything else. I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. For kings and those in authority, that we may live peacefully and quiet lives, in godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior. Same thing Paul talked about in Romans 12, 1 and 2. This service, this worship that pleases God. Who wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. But the problem in Ephesus was, as we read earlier, that Timothy needed to command certain people not to teach false doctrines. Or devote themselves, devote themselves... That's what they're devoted to. The one they're serving and what they're doing, whether they realize it or not. Devote themselves to myths and endless gene genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than what? Advancing the gospel, God's word, his logos. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, advancing the good news of Jesus Christ, which is by faith. So what are you doing? What am I doing? What are we doing? Are we advancing the gospel? That's why I said, and I'd probably talk about it earlier, I talked about these ministries where we could serve. At the Restorium, there is a group of girls coming in every Sunday. I don't know who they are. I could put some guesses, but that's not even the point. Every Sunday. I'm sure they have other things they're committed to, other things that they're busy with, but they're coming every Sunday but no church committed. And as Joy added to that, there wasn't a committal, good committal before COVID. Is that not a need? Do they not need to hear about Jesus? Do we not bring them comfort and joy if we go out there? 
So yes, I'm so thankful that we'll commit to at least one and hopefully others will see and follow. And maybe we'll decide ourselves that we have more time than that, commit to more than that. Tabitha's here now. We talked about restorium. I mean, not restorium. Hair care. Consider that, if that's something we can have. I just saw her over there. So that we could bring that service. And there's so many services to people that are in need. This is just one. We serve in Awanas because we have a need to tell other children than just the ones that come here. You serve in Sunday school and other things. We do VBS. I am proud to be a part of this church. I don't care about the finances. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Give where you can give. <laughs> now that you see that we need it, give even more. But I care about the fact that we're sharing the gospel message and the love of Christ Jesus, that it's written in our hearts. And we can't help pro but proclaim. <clears throat> I'll remind you again of what Romans 12, 1 and 2 said, because it needs to be a mo motto verse of yours. Therefore, with everything Paul has written up to this point, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So as you're reading Timothy, you see that Paul, first thing that he does is urge Timothy that he needs to lead the church to prayer. Hebrews says, The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. God works through prayer to show you the works that can be done by a praying, submitting people. So I ask you to pray for all of these ministries. I ask you again to pray for comfort and that people are drawn to Christ Jesus through the deaths that we talked about, through the loss of life. Because the thing that's different about Christians is we know that the loss of life is just an entrance into eternal life. So live like that is your hope and your glory. Because we just read that it is God's will. He is the one who wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And you know the truth. That means we can't conform to this world. We have to be transformed. We have to live a life of truth. 2 Timothy 2 verses 8 says, Therefore, I want men everywhere to pray. So maybe there was a lack of prayer in that church. We already know that there were problems in the church as far as meaningless talk and genealogies. I want men everywhere to pray. Say it again, so make sure you heard it. I want men everywhere to pray. And that word is not just to the men. Okay, let's read on. <clears throat> Lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. In verse 9, I also want women to dress modestly in decency and, pro and propriety. He wants women to be involved in the ministry also. Even in this church in Ephesus, which is having problems. We already looked at the root word back in uh, Romans 16, it's gender, gender neutral, that we saw there was a deacon in the church, in the church at Tenchoria, if I said it correctly. But here we got problems in the church. So the women must not have been dressing modestly, and they must have been trying to take on teaching roles that they weren't trained to do. Oh, did you ever read that into it? With proper training, there are women in the Bible that are holding these offices. The proper training that Timothy himself went through. So it's not that a woman needs to be trained more than a man or anything else. Don't go down those, those things. It means in that church, the men were trained for those positions. But now in this church, the men were off on genealogies they shouldn't have been on. And the women were dressing whatever they were dressing and teaching where they shouldn't have been teaching. Okay? All of you women have places in ministry. When we were, cre when we were created, you were, woman was taken from man from a rib as an equal counterpart to be helpmate. 100% equal. And we can go down those roads again, like I said, in the theology and doctrine, but I just want to point out to you that, that Paul did not say here, women, keep your mouth shut and keep them shut. 
That is not what he said. Okay? You can read it beyond that. <clears throat> a woman should, verse 10, rather than, well, finishing in verse 9, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothing, but being in church and having good deeds. Same thing as anyone else. All people that are created, all human beings, are to be one of good deeds, especially if they know who Christ Jesus is, which is appropriate for women who profess to worship God. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I said it just so you can see that. Now you can go back and study it yourself, but I set up the, the dynamics of this church to understand that verse before you just go to that verse. And the Bible says women should read the whole thing. Chapter 3, here's a trustworthy saving, verse 1. Whoever, it's a gender-neutral pronoun again, aspires to be an overseer, a bishop desires a noble task. Now the overseer or bishop is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife. Okay, we've got gender there, but we've got the rules set up for this church. Okay? Go on down to verse 8. In the same way, deacons, the gender-neutral word again, same word used in Romans 16 when he says, I commend to you, my sister Phoebe, a deacon. They are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. Okay, I don't know the problems in the church again, but I know what Paul addressed. So anyone in the church, male or female, should be trained and should have decent behavior. Because there certainly had to be a problem that people weren't being trained right and they didn't have decent behavior. They were running church as a business, as a fellowship hall. Whatever it was, they weren't running it for the purpose of advancing the gospel message and of doing the good deeds of God being the hands and feet in this in his world. So as you read Timothy, Read it with what I just told you. Go back and read it, read it through, so that you don't get hung up on something that causes you problems and you follow that rabbit trail. Paul can't get to Ephesus. There's problems in this church. He sends a young man that he sees the love of God in who he's trained up, and he says, go direct this church into truth so that they can be service to the world around them. That's my sum summation of Timothy. Paul goes on to write that he's writing these things to Timothy because he is delayed, but he hopes to be there. And in verse 15 of Romans, I mean, of 1 Timothy 3, he says, You will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household. Now, what I want to point out here is your first thoughts in this world today is that means in this church building. No, it doesn't. God's household is His people. Don't take church again, because that's Satan's ploy to you, his lie to you, that this is church. This is church. This is how you're supposed to conduct yourself if you are a Christian. So that when you're, when you're in these walls and you're without, outside of these walls, you are living a life that shows glory and honor to God. You're giving Him thanks. You're in fellowship with Him. You're studying and reading your, your Bible. You're praying. You're having intercessory prayer for others so that you can't help but to pray for Mary Ann's family, for Merle's, Denning's family, not this Merle, so we don't get confused and you think something different. That you can't help because you feel their loss and you want to bring them comfort because God has brought you comfort. You can't help but to do that. Because Christ reigns and rules in your heart and in your life. You will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God. Oh, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Dying to what you thought was important, what you thought was gain, it should be considered rubbish or garbage. We still have our family, still have our friends, but if I really love my family, I'm going to do my best to live a life that proclaims Jesus Christ and tell them of the hope that they have. Not just go out and work and provide for them, but to show them Jesus in the flesh while we have the flesh. 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2 says, The Spirit clearly says, 
that in the later time some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose conscience, there's the word again, has been seared as with a hot iron. Sincere faith and a good conscience. Is your faith sincere? Do you have a good conscience? So I'm going to close with prayer, and I pray that you pray with me specifically for the pain and hurting in this world, for those who need Jesus, for us to be called, to rededicate, to commit to being the hands and feet of Jesus Christ while we have the breath of God in us. Let us not put off today what we can put off to tomorrow what we can do today. Let this be the day of our salvation. Let this be the day of our proclamation. Don't put other things in the way. Mary Ann, she's been sick. She wouldn't really tell me all the things that's going on with her. I kept picking at her. Most of it was by text. A lot of you don't text, but a lot of people do. So don't think there's anything wrong with text. I'd rather you text me. Then I can get back to you when I want to. And when I need to speak beyond text, I will call you and we'll talk about that. But I talked to her by mainly text prior. Then all of a sudden Friday she calls and says, I want prayer. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. She's ready to talk. But we didn't get to pray over her. We did. We prayed in the board meeting downstairs, but we didn't get to physically lay hands on her. I don't know what she knew, what she felt, anything else. But she reached out to this church, not me. I'm just the conduit to, to get to you. She reached out to this church because she knew the power of prayer. And she was scared. And so before she went to the hospital, she said, I want everyone to pray over me. And then Saturday night, she was taken to the hospital. And Steve got to talk with her and everything. And then she went lethargic after that, and she passed away Tuesday morning. I didn't have the opportunity. Now, I'm talking about myself and how I felt. I didn't have the opportunity to go see her prior to that, per se. Because she's coming in Sunday. We're going to pray over her. I can talk to her then. I'll see her then. I'm okay with that. Saturday night, she goes to the hospital. It's late. Don't know what we're doing. I don't know if I should go up there then. The Spirit isn't leading me to do that. But, man, that's hard to tell, guys. If you've got an urge, follow it, unless there's some reason you can't. If there's a position that needs you to do it, if somebody needs to go to the restoring, why can't you? Isn't it the thing that you should do, be doing good deeds? What is stopping you so many times? You don't have to have a burning bush telling you to go. Just sit down for a minute and say, what's stopping you from doing the, whatever that is? So she gets transferred to Kalispell. Monday morning I get up and I say, get dressed, Sherry. <laughs> Because I wasn't at ease all Sunday night. She said, why? I said, because we're going to Cowspell. And we got there. We spent time with her. I was not at ease. We stayed there till we had to get home that night if we were going to get home that night. Praise God that I got to see her and be with her family because she passed away the next morning. Now, Monday's my busiest day at work. <laughs> Monday, I could give you a written million reasons why we couldn't. Oh, surely we'll find out. They're going to do testing and everything. I can put off till tomorrow. I couldn't have in this case. Period. There was no tomorrow. What if today was the last day that you could proclaim Jesus Christ? That day will come, whether it's your death or Jesus Christ returns again. And then you won't be able to tell the little ones that you love about Jesus anymore. That day will have happened. So I'm going to pray, and I wish you would pray with me, and I love and thank God for this church and the service that you give. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you that you are in control of all things. We do not understand your ways at all. And Lord, we may question them or even be angry or anything else, Lord. But your ways are higher than ours. And I've seen throughout my life and through my faith how you've grown it. Because I didn't understand the things. <clears throat> but Lord, I know that you're in control of all things. I know that because of my faith in Jesus Christ, I know that I have a hope. That even though I cannot see, that no one can shake that hope. Lord, increase our faith. 
Increase our faith not to be entangled by the things of this world, but to live a life of love. We know that you'll provide us with all things, and we know that it is your will that all people come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the privilege and opportunity to serve you and to be the hands and feet of Jesus in this world. Oh, Lord, help us not to get out of the habit of meeting together. Help us not to be distracted in this world. Help us to use the freedoms that we have and the, and the time that we have that we say that we don't have. Oh, I just don't have so much time because I'm so busy with the things that I desire rather than the things of the kingdom. Lord, we thank you for rest, the sleep that we have that, that renews us for the next day and the things that you put in our path. Help us to be in tune with your spirit so that we can walk in the spirit. Lord, help us to be a body united together, knowing the gifts that you've given us, discovering those gifts so that we can use them together to serve one another. Let us comfort when we need to comfort. Let us rejoice when we need to rejoice. Let us teach when we need to teach. Let us even reprimand or whatever the word is, Lord, that I'm looking for when we walk out of your fellowship. To be such in tune with you and with each other that we can come to one another and say, hey, how's your walk doing? What about this? Let us be accountable to one another. Lord, let us be like Jesus who did not consider heaven something that he should hold on to, but instead gave it up so that he'd come and die for us. He who did not have the, all the comforts of this world that we have and who joyfully went to the cross, an instrument of ridicule, suffering, and shame, which he was not guilty of any crime, falsely accused, degraded in so many ways, poked and prodded to bring down a legion of angels to take himself off that cross, but he wouldn't before the joy set before him. Lord, thank you that Jesus is at the right hand of, by your side, Lord, interceding for us. Thank you that you sent the Holy Spirit to indwell us, to teach us, to comfort us, to seal us for all eternity. May we have our minds transformed. Help us to let go of this world and to cling to Jesus as our life preserver, as our anchor, as our strength, so that we don't drift away, and certainly so that we don't become shipwrecked. We thank you and praise you for such a great salvation. We pray specifically today that you comfort Mary Ann's family, that you let them know that you are in complete control. Lord, that we serve and tell others of the hope that we have and that you bring people to salvation as in your will and the will that we should have for one another, Lord, that none be lost. I can't begin to even fathom is how fast it came, what the daughters, what Bob is thinking, everything else, Lord. I, I know that they are questioning. I know that they need to be, be comforted. And you've left us here on earth to do that job, not through our own power or our own might, but the power of the Holy Spirit. So I pray, Lord, a special outpouring of the Spirit today on each and every one here, not only to be a comfort to Mary Ann's family, but to continue to be a comfort and a light to this world until Jesus Christ returns. I pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.